Are we ready for God's word? Yes. Now, what does the heart of a faithful servant of Christ look like? Was the Apostle Paul a faithful servant of Christ? He sure was. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, we get a glimpse into the heart of the Apostle Paul, a faithful servant. And my hope tonight is that you and I would leave here determined to be a faithful servant of Christ ourselves. So if you will, turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 3, and we are going to read from verses 1 through 13. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I hope you'll follow along as I read. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by the revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Verse 7, of this gospel I was made a minister according to the, gifts, the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authority in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for this privilege that we have now to study your word. God, may you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, press it into our hearts, into our lives. Bring transformation, we pray. God, it is our desire to leave here having met with you and to go out and apply the truths that you would have to teach us through your word tonight. And it's in the strong, mighty, and powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen, amen. and amen. So what is the heart of a faithful servant of Christ? In his book, Tortured for Christ, Pastor Richard Wormbrandt, who, is, who in the 1940s was a pastor in Romania. And at that time in Romania, Romania was a communist country. He explained what he went through while he was in prison in Romania. The torture that he endured while in prison for many years. Months of solitary confinement. Years of ongoing periodic beatings. Just horrible things this pastor went through because he was a follower of Jesus Christ and more specifically because he was a leader of Christians. There are many things that he had done that I can share with you, but one of the things that he's done is a publication to awaken the church in the West to the matter of martyrdom, to the matter of persecution. 
and it is still going on today around our world. Pastor Rob Rembrandt began his monthly publication known as Voice of the Martyrs. How many of you have heard of that publication before? In his book, Tortured for Christ, there is one section that says, quote, we made a deal. We preach and they beat. It was strictly forbidden to preach to others in prisons as it is in most captive nations today. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching. So we accepted their terms. It was a deal. We preach and they beat us. We were happy preaching. They were happy beating. So both were happy. <laughs> the following scene happened more times than I could remember. A brother was preaching to the other prisoners when the guard suddenly burst in, surprising halfway, surprising him halfway through the phrase. He hauled him down the corridor to their beating room. After what seemed to be an endless beating, they brought him back, bloodied and bruised, and threw him on the prison floor. Slowly, he picked himself up, battered, and painfully straightened his clothing and said, Now, brethren, where did I leave off when I was so rudely interrupted? <laughs> and he continued preaching the gospel message to his fellow prisoners that day, end quote. What a remarkable heart of a servant of Christ. What a remarkable act of a servant of the Lord. Unspeakable acts of servants of Christ who would declare that Jesus is Lord. As you know, the Apostle Paul was writing to the Ephesian believers while he was in prison himself in Rome. And I think we find here in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 13, the heart of a faithful servant. Now, there are two main thoughts I'd like to share with you from this passage that reveals this heart of a faithful servant of Christ. So are you ready, note takers? Here's the point, the first point. A faithful servant of Christ has the right priorities. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. Two thoughts here explains his imprisonment. First, it was for the sake of the Gentiles. And then secondly, it is as an ambassador for Christ. Paul had been in prison up to this point for five years. He had been arrested on false charges made by the Jews. Although imprisoned by the Roman authority, he did not consider himself a prisoner of Rome. He was a minister of Jesus Christ, bought with a price and given a special mission of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. He was therefore a prisoner of Christ. Verse 2, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Now, I want you to just highlight, underline, just take a note of that word steward. A steward was responsible for taking care of that which belonged to someone else. A faithful servant of Christ has the right priority on being a good steward. A steward of their time, talent, treasure, and testimony. Each of us believers are stewards of our spiritual gifts, opportunities, skills, knowledge, and every other blessing we have from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Everything that we have belongs to the Lord. And we are entrusted as stewards to manage our lives and everything we possess on behalf of the one to whom they belong. 
We are to be faithful stewards when we use what we have to minister to those within the family of God. So, loved ones, do you focus your mind's attention on him? Your heart's affection for him? And your will's submission to him like he deserves? Because that's what we think of when we think of the heart of a faithful servant of Christ. We have the right priorities and that comes to stewardship of our time, talent, treasure, and the testimony. Look at verse 3. How the mystery was made known to me by the revelation as I have written briefly. Now, I want you to notice how the gospel here is referred to mystery. It is used, that word mystery is used four times between verses 3 and verses 14. Mystery in our language is knowledge withheld. Mystery in the Greek language, mysterion, which is where we get our English word mystery, is knowledge revealed. So what is the mystery? Something only known in the mind of God until it is revealed to us. This mystery is that the Jew and the Gentiles are one in Christ. It's about our union with Christ. Union with Christ, what does that mean? I am brought into an intimate relationship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ, and this changes every aspect of my life for the better. In these days, when this was being written, there was great animosity between the Jews and the Gentiles. Great prejudice. The strict Orthodox Jew got up every morning and thanked God that he was not born a Gentile. And they believed truly that the only purpose for the Gentiles was to be fathers for the fires, um, fuel for the fathers of the fires of hell. So now these Jews are having to accept the fact that the Gentiles are getting saved. We are not sure that we like this. Gentiles getting saved. They are not one of us. So in Ephesians, Paul has to spend some time saying that Jesus died for both. He died for both Jews. He died for the Gentiles. And that's the effect that Jesus' sacrifice has to reconcile us to God and to reconcile us to each other. That's why the church, both local and universal, needs to welcome everyone. We don't condone sin, but we welcome people into the house of the Lord. Where socioeconomic status does not matter. Where the casual wear and the formal wear does not matter. Where the short hair and then in the Caribbean context, the dreadlocks <laughs> does not matter. Where the person with the piercings and the tattoos can sit next to the doctors and the lawyers and the fishermen and all are embraced. Where the things that tend to divide people in this world, we want those things not to matter. Why? Because they do not matter to God. Slave, free, black, white, Jew, Gentile, all are precious in his sight once we know him as Savior and Lord. Verse 4 says, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. Paul's intention was not simply to declare the mystery, but to explain it and to clarify it. So that when the Ephesian believers and subsequently us as believers read this explanation that we would understand and gain insight into the mystery of Christ. Insight literally means to bring together and refers to the comprehension and understanding. The opposite of spiritual insight is foolishness. 
Paul did not get his zeal for the gospel and his passions for souls from his high emotional experiences. His love and passion and energetic, energetic zeal to win the loss came because he had insight into the gospel. The heart of a faithful servant of Christ is seen when we prioritize sharing the gospel. The more we comprehend God's love, the more we comprehend God's grace, the more we are compelled and, and exemplify the love, that love and grace, the more that we are compelled to share the gospel. Paul was so filled with the understanding of the mystery of Christ that he sacrificed his health, he sacrificed his freedom, he sacrificed his very life in the ministry of imparting that understanding to others that, that they could come to an understanding. That is what the heart of a faithful servant of Jesus Christ looks like. They have a passion for souls. Verse 4 says, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This mystery was hidden and I would like to trace this mystery throughout, throughout scripture for you because it's very cool. Genesis chapter three, verses 14 to 15. This is the place in time where God confronted the sin of Adam and Eve and he's now cursing the serpent who deceived Adam and Eve. Verse 14 of Genesis chapter three, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put en enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now this was the very beginning, loved ones, of the unveiling of the mystery. When it says he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel, it's an imagery, imagery talking about the coming of Christ. It's an imagery talking about the crucifixion. Jesus was bruised when they beat his body and when he hung on that tree. But what did he do with the serpent? He cursed the serpent and he bruised the head of the serpent. The devil did not win. Because Jesus Christ conquered death. The devil did not win because Jesus Christ conquered the grave. He's alive. He's well. He's active in our lives today. But this was veiled and not completely understood by so many. There is more to the mystery. In Genesis chapter 12, this is the call of Abraham. And I will make you a great nation, beginning in verse 2. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham at the time did not fully understand what God was saying to him. But we know now because we have the privilege, this side of the cross, to fully understand what God meant by that. When he said that Abraham, when he said to Abraham, by you all the people and families of the earth will be blessed, he was referring to the fact that the coming Messiah, who we now know to be Jesus Christ, through Abraham will come the Messiah who will die for the sins of the world, who would become the ransom for our sins by the shedding of his blood on the cross. 
Jesus Christ comes. Jesus Christ lives. Jesus Christ dies and he rises and he calls the apostle Paul to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He reveals these things to Paul and Paul writes about them to us. Paul is revealing to us that God all the way back in Genesis chapter 12 was revealing the gospel message to us. That that mystery way back in Genesis is now crystal clear to us. Jesus Christ came, he died, he rose again to give us a chance of eternity with him. Now that Paul understood this, he's like, I'm totally committed to this. And I've got to tell you, we need to be totally committed to it as well. It's our responsibility, loved ones, to share the gospel. How are you doing? The gospel means good news. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, good news. That's what the gospel means. It's good news. Are you sharing that good news? The heart of a faithful servant of Christ is revealing this, that they make sharing the good news of Jesus Christ a priority. Now, not only is the heart of a faithful servant seen in the bright priorities of being a good steward, time, talent, treasure, and testimony, and sharing the gospel, but here's the second thing. A faithful servant of Christ has the right perspective. What's your own homemade definition of perspective? What does that mean? Isn't it interesting that we can have 10 people observe the exact same circumstance at the exact same moment in time, and yet those 10 people, depending on where they're standing, will have a different perspective on the event? Look at verse 7. Of this gospel I was made to minister according to the gifts of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though, I am very the, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God who created all things. When we talk about perspective, there are two areas that rise to the surface, loved ones, in this text. Paul sets an example for us on having the right perspective. Paul had the right perspective on the matter of grace. It's a matter of grace. We need to have the right perspective on the necessity of grace to minister. Of this gospel, I was made to minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, supernatural enabling power to do what he has called us to do and to be what he has called us to be. It's infused into us by his spirit. The opposite of serving the Lord through grace is serving the Lord through our own strength. And trust me, you don't want to do that. Because that leads to disappointment. That leads to frustration. That leads to bitterness. That's where serving the Lord in the flesh leads. Why? Because serving the Lord in the flesh means that we are looking for recognition. It means that we're looking for approval. It means that we want the praise of men rather than the praise of God because that's what's driving our flesh. Now, how many of you think that the Apostle Paul, while he was in prison, could have felt this way while he was writing? But he had, he had God's grace and God's grace gave him the right perspective. The Lord was at, the Lord was the power behind the servant. Colossians 1.29, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that the powerful works within me. Verse 8 says to me, 
Though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Though Paul considered himself specifically chosen to minister these mysteries of the gospel, Paul also considered himself least among the saints. Isn't that interesting? Why? Because he had a clear understanding of God's righteousness and how far short he fell. Verse 8 says, To preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches of Christ include all the blessings which are now ours in Christ as believers. We are blessed. <laughs> Amen? Amen. We, we, we are blessed. We are rich in Christ. The obedient, productive, happy Christian life cannot be lived apart from understanding that glorious position that we have in Christ. Before we can do what the Lord wants us to do for him, we have to understand what he has already done for us. Many people miss that. What are those riches? His kindness, his patience, his mercy, his love, his glory, his supplying us with all the things to enjoy, his assurance, his word. Verse 9 says, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the ages in God who created all things. What's, the, what's Paul saying here? Is that our mission is not only to be vertical, but it's to be horizontal. The first is our relationship to God, and the second is our ministry to others. We become conduits of God's grace to other people. Love for God and love for others. Verse 10, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the external purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. A faithful servant of Christ has the right perspective on the need for grace. And then they have the right perspective on the role of hardships. What was Paul's perspective on his suffering? He was in prison. Here's what he said to them. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Loved ones, the vast majority of us have no idea what it means to suffer for Christ. <coughs> it was one year ago on Easter Sunday. My parents attended church. I preached my heart out. I shared the good news of Jesus Christ. During both of our services, people got saved. We all went home on a high. Woo! <laughs> and then I got a call that afternoon from my brother saying that my mom fell and she could not get up. I was like, what do you mean? She just walked up all the steps. She was in church worshiping God. He called me a few hours later and he said, Al, something is wrong. My mom had never been sick. So the next day we took her to the doctor. They did her blood work and I saw the look on the doctor's face. She said, we need to do a CT scan. We did a CT scan and they said, this looks like cancer. So I said, well, what do we do? They said, well, we need to do a biopsy, but because we live on this small island, it can't be done here. It's, it's an invasive surgery. Now, understand this, loved ones. Two years before, my 46-year-old brother was diagnosed with rectal cancer. He was in New York at Kings County Hospital doing chemo and radiation and everything, so... Our family got together, we decided, all right, we cannot do this surgery here 
let us take her to New York at Kings County Hospital. So we decided to do that, to take her to Kings County Hospital. While we were there, they did the biopsy. The doctor came back and here's what he told me. He said, this cancer is at stage four. It has spread all throughout her body. I gave her six months to live. He said, if I were you, I will take her home and make her comfortable. So we flew her back to St. Vincent. That very week we flew her back to St. Vincent, my brother called. He said, Al, I just met with the doctors. They said that my cancer has now spread to stage four. So I digested that. And then a couple of days later, I called him. I said, Nigel, mom is dying. I think you need to come home to see her before she dies. Spend some time with your daughters. So he came home. And in our house, we had a cancer patient in one room, stage four. A cancer patient in another room, stage four. And all oh, the moans and the groans of pain. During the night, it was so hard. I had to come and stay at the house with my dad. It was just too much for him. My mom passed away. We gave her a funeral. Fitting for the daughter of the king. <laughs> and one month after my mom died, one month, this very week, last year, my brother passed away. We were not even finished with the funeral, completing all the funeral stuff for my mom when my brother passed away. Now, here's the thing, loved ones, a perspective on hardships. My parents had been in ministry for over 50 years, 53 years. They had been married for 40 years. My dad is well known throughout the island, well known throughout the Caribbean. Now, here is his son, the pastor. And Pastor Gary will tell you, we have a thriving church on the island, one of the fastest growing churches on the island. Everyone's eyes were on us. How are these pastors going to deal with this? And I am here to tell you that in the midst of our suffering, God granted us grace. In the midst of our suffering, we had a perspective on what God was doing. We learn to live fully and grieve fully. I have learned to make him the constant companion of my thoughts. To love him with all of my heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. Not just on Sunday mornings. Not just on Wednesdays, but every day. Not secretly, but openly. Not quietly, but loudly and freely. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So what does the heart of a faithful servant of Christ look like? A faithful servant of God has the right priorities. And the faithful servant of Christ has the right perspective on the need for grace and on the road and on the role of hardship and suffering. I am not just telling you, I have lived it. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. The way it speaks to our hearts and lives and challenges us. Lord, may we have the right priority on being good stewards of our time, talent, treasure, and testimony. That on sharing the gospel with others. Give us a passion, dear God, for the lost. Help us to have the right perspective on the need for grace in our lives to minister to others and the right perspective on suffering. 
Lord, help us to be faithful in praying for our brothers and sisters around the world. Lord, help us to be faithful servants of Jesus Christ. And it's in the strong, mighty, and precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. God bless you.